In late April 1951, a Chinese army marched six abreast towards a narrow point in the Kapyong Valley in Korea. There stood hundreds of Australians, Canadians, and New Zealanders, facing 10,000 Chinese, intent on taking the capital city of Seoul. We were up against a real tough, clever enemy, and so many of them, so many of them. Had they broken through at Cap Yong, it would have been a bloody disaster. And that could have turned the whole course of the war. The Chinese first hit the Australians. 600 men spread across a low hill. A similar number of Canadians on the next. There was the key battle that the Commonwealth Division fought in the whole Korean War. I think Cap Yong should be studied as a perfect battle. Though the Battle of Cap Yong remains largely unknown, those who were there cannot forget. The slaughter of the enemy was just unimaginable. It still gives me nightmare. If the Chinese army could not be stopped, a nuclear World War III was waiting in the wings. MacArthur had a great plan to drop 24, 25, 26 atomic bombs. Against this backdrop of nuclear genocide, man fought against man for a hill. I'm 20 years old. Jesus, am I going to see 21? This is the story of the Battle of Capion, a forgotten battle in a forgotten war. Just before Anzac Day, 1951, Australian soldiers arrive in a secluded valley after 10 months of heavy action. They're part of a United Nations force sent at the urging of the Americans to push back the communist North Koreans after their invasion of the Democratic South. On Sunday, June 25th, communist forces attacked the Republic of Korea. Free nations must be on their guard more than ever before against this kind of sneak attack. 20 countries contributed to the UN force, nations as diverse as Ethiopia, Costa Rica and Turkey, as well as members of the British Commonwealth. Australian Prime Minister Robert Menzies sent his troops hoping to sweeten military ties with the US. The Australians found the fighting fierce. The UN has suffered a series of defeats, and by April of 1951, the 3rd Royal Australian Regiment have earned their break, 36 kilometers behind the front line. They camp near the village of Kapyong in a peaceful spot, which they christen Sherwood Forest. Well, for six months, we've been fighting the war, constantly in action, constantly in contact with the enemy. We weren't expecting a rest, but we were moved to this lovely green valley with a creek flowing through the middle, and uh, we were able to put up two-man pup tents, which was a bit of a luxury, because on the move, you're sleeping out in the open. Uh, every night, rain, hail, or shine. We had meals that were coming from a field kitchen, so they were served on plates. There were no duties to perform. We were completely at liberty to take a rest. <laughs> Also relishing the rest is Second World War veteran and Australian commander, Lieutenant Colonel Bruce Ferguson. I really enjoyed the spell. We were scheduled to be there for a fortnight, and all the soldiers sat down once a day for a long bath and came home every night for a beer. Life was very relaxing and pleasant. At the centre of this idyllic retreat sits a purpose-built caravan, a command centre for Lieutenant Colonel Ferguson. It contains his maps, his radio, and telephone. It had a heater, a bunk, and a table. Cheers, cheers. <laughs> and he liked to dine with fresh flowers. And it was often the task of his junior officers to gather them for him. An anonymous digger, christened Ferguson's home on wheels, Pandora's box. We had this thing tagging along behind us all the way up to North Korea and all the way back again. He was extremely comfortable. 
And I suppose he deserved to be. But uh, Fergie wanted a caravan and he had one. As Anzac Day approaches, the Australians relax. They've organized a barbecue. They hoard their beer rations and plan to invite the Turks. But the peace of Sherwood Forest is about to be broken. Hello? The Australians are ordered to move up to survey defensive positions should the South Koreans at the front be suddenly attacked. If they break, the Australians around Hill 504 now command a position overlooking the Kapyong Valley. Bergson explained to us that the Korean division was holding, but we were to recce a blocking position in case things went wrong. Once we'd done the recce, we could go back and get on with the rest. It's just, it just a really a nothing thing. We dug slit trenches, set up our weapons, and uh, waited, waited to uh, see what happened. The Australians wait, dotted around a low hill named 504, on the eastern side of a narrow point in the Capyong Valley. Opposite them, another part of the Commonwealth Brigade the Princess Patricia's Canadian Light Infantry are digging in on a larger and steeper hill, 677. Both realize something has gone very wrong. Republic of Korea soldiers have been coming through our position. What have they experienced that has so terrified them? It was as though they were hypnotized. They didn't see you. They just had one objective, run south. Uh, I've never seen such chaos or fear in my life. The front has broken. New Zealand artillery sent forward to support the South Koreans are now caught behind terrified refugees and fleeing soldiers. They must get their prized 25-pound guns out. No one can get in the way. They're trying to clamber on our trucks, but they're told us, don't let anyone on the truck. They don't know who the hell they are. They could be infiltrators or what they are. But they're no weapons. And it, I mean, it's quite frightening. Despite the chaos of refugees and panic of fleeing soldiers, the New Zealanders somehow get their guns through. A distressed and terrorised population are streaming down the road. It takes pretty resolute, experienced soldiers to say, we're holding this ground, we're not joining that mob. The increasing numbers on the road make the Australian commander on Hill 504, Major Ben O'Dowd, nervous. He and his men are suddenly on the front line of a bloody conflict, which started just 10 months earlier. In June 1950, when the communist North Koreans invaded, they aimed to reunite their country, divided along the 38th parallel by the Russians and the Americans after World War II. A United Nations resolution, triggered by the US, established a force to push the communists back. The UN commander is America's World War II hero, General Douglas MacArthur. MacArthur decides to tackle the North Koreans with soldiers based in occupied Japan. He expects a swift victory. The troops that the Americans initially sent across from Japan, they'd been on garrison duties, they weren't well trained, they weren't fit, and they were pushed back rapidly along with the South Koreans. So virtually all of South Korea was overrun except for a tiny enclave at Pusan at the southeastern tip of South Korea. General Douglas MacArthur implements a bold plan. He stages a surprise beach landing at Seoul's port city of Incheon. 
and effectively cuts his enemy's advance in half. He did marshal an enormous invasion force that succeeded in retaking Seoul within a week uh, and cut off about 75,000 North Korean soldiers in the south. As soon as the Incheon landing uh, appeared to be successful, the idea of invading the north uh, was on the table, and we went ahead and invaded North Korea, which turned into a complete debacle. The Australians, as part of the Commonwealth Brigade, push north. Six weeks after landing in Incheon, they are near the Yalu River, looking across the border into China. MacArthur had made the statement that the war was over and the troops would be home by Christmas. And uh, a month went by, a frozen month, you know. We were in trenches, facing north, with the cold wind from Manchuria blowing into your face so that you, you had to turn your head away from it even to be able to breathe the air. And we didn't really know what was going on. We, uh, uh, we just watched our front and, uh, and waited to see. The leader of communist China, Mao Zedong, is increasingly nervous about activity on his border. China makes numerous public and international threats that it will enter the war, but MacArthur ignores them. Well, MacArthur gave posthumous interviews where he said that he had a great plan for the Chinese coming into the war, and that was to drop 24, 25, 26 atomic bombs uh, along the Yalu River including cobalt bombs, which uh, uh, would make the place uninhabitable for about a century, uh, and that this would have been a very simple plan, but Truman wouldn't go along with it. Mao Zedong decides to act. He nominates General Peng as supreme Chinese commander, and in mid-October 1950, the fabric of the Korean War changes drastically. thousand Chinese troops cross into North Korea. The Chinese immediately push the foreigners back, forcing the Americans and their allies into a bitter winter retreat. First thing in the morning, we got told to got half an hour to pack up and out. The Chinese are coming to the wall. And then next minute, they're all scooting down south. The whole battalion got broken up. The blokes are jumping on trucks trying to get out. MacArthur and his intelligence chief, their idea of how to conduct intelligence was to base it on their stew of ethnic stereotypes that both of them believed in. And one of them was that your, your average Chinaman can't fight and won't fight and will run away from the battle. The US has superior firepower. If the American planes saw a target, they would drop lots of bombs. They like to burn their money. The American wage war in a different way from us. They have so many bombs to use. The Chinese army did not have any airplanes. Also, we had very few artillery pieces. So we had to use the tactics of guerrilla war. If you are small in numbers, we will attack. If you are a big group, we won't. We depended on manpower. The Chinese Supreme Commander, General Peng, rolls out four very successful campaigns. And by January of 1951, Seoul has fallen to the Chinese. The US Army is in disarray. 
That was a tremendous humiliation for MacArthur. He did go into a panic and called for all-out war, bombing the Yalu bases, bombing Manchuria, and of course that was inimical to what Truman wanted and what the American government at that stage wanted. They wanted to contain the war, and what MacArthur was proposing was a massive escalation. In early April of 1951, US President Harry S. Truman takes a decisive step. He sacks his top general in Korea. General Matthew Ridgway replaces MacArthur. After retaking Seoul, UN troops push north to form the Utah Line, a defense stretching the width of the country. They await the might of the inevitable Chinese Fifth Offensive. By late afternoon of April 23rd, the Chinese have broken through and are heading down the Kapyong Valley, the traditional invasion route to Seoul. Major Ben O'Dowd, in charge of the Australians on Hill 504, watches as South Korean troops and civilians flee south. I knew from past experience that the Chinese soldiers would mix in with the civilians. I rang the commanding officer and requested permission to open fire with the machine guns to stop all movement on the road. But Ferguson refused me permission to open fire on the grounds there might still be South Korean soldiers coming through too. The odd shot rang out. Then I repeated my request. This prompted the accusation, a doubt, you're panicking. Almost immediately, an attack is made on lines around Ferguson's battalion headquarters, further down the valley. The Chinese are through. Responding quickly, the US 72nd Tank Battalion goes toward Hill 504, but have no orders to cooperate with the Australians. Their radios work on a different frequency, and they act independently. Operating from the open turret position, a US commander is shot, and the tanks close down. The tanks hose each other with machine gun fire to wipe the enemy off. Without infantry support, the Americans are forced to withdraw. By dusk, the Australians, now alone, await the Chinese attack. The tanks gone, the diggers will depend upon the support of New Zealand artillery. The New Zealand artillery have to reposition after fleeing the rout. They set up their 25-pound guns behind hills defended by Australians on one side and Canadians on the other. These three groups must now stand and face the might of 10,000 Chinese bent on retaking Seoul. Diggers soon learn that they will fight without artillery support. Well, the New Zealanders didn't arrive until dark and they couldn't zero the guns in. And uh, it's necessary for them to get their guns pointed in the right direction and get the range right so they can put their artillery where they want to. And it took them until quite late the next day before they were able to come into the action. Without the threat of artillery, the Chinese are free to probe the Australian lines. Ben O'Dowd expects the worst. We had no wire or anti-personnel mines or anything else to interpose between attacker and defender. It was to be soldier against soldier at very close range in the dark. It started in earnest 
with the Chinese blowing bugles and whistles. They used these to assemble their men. When the bugles and whistles stopped, we knew that they were on their way. of Capion had started. They just say coming at you. And I'd stop and just keep coming. When a company was gone after the first charge, then they sent in another company, one after another, just like that. It was a human wave and no artillery support. For us, there was no other way to fight. We had many more soldiers than them. Each time we knocked them back, the Chinese just disappeared for a while. In between assaults, our wounded and dead were brought back, and fit men were repositioned by section commanders into forward positions. We were in danger of being overrun. There is no rest for the defenders. The Chinese attack again and again, every 20 minutes throughout the night. Wave after wave after wave, yeah, that's how they came in. And, and the, probably the third wave and the fourth wave wasn't even armed. They'd pick up the weapons of the boats killed in front of them. Benno Dowd's number one platoon closest to the road is running out of men. At 1 a.m. he's forced to make a decision to give up ground. He orders the survivors to withdraw. When Ferguson's battalion headquarters is also assaulted, he takes his maps and personal effects and decides to move five kilometers to the rear so that Pandora's box, his command caravan, does not fall into enemy hands, he orders it destroyed. I think that Lieutenant Colonel Ferguson misread the noise, the chaos, and the firing that was going on around his battalion headquarters. He decided that it was best for him to control the battle was to go further rearwards, away from this dangerous situation. The problem was he didn't issue orders for that to happen in an orderly manner. And indeed, a number of officers were quite surprised when they couldn't find their commanding officer among them in the morning. With daylight on the second day, Ben O'Dowd orders an attack across the road to reclaim ground number one platoon lost during the night. The New Zealanders also take advantage of the daylight. They are now able to range in their weapons and bring to bear the considerable firepower of their 25-pound guns. With clear observation, we could bring heavy weapons of all kinds into action against them. Hundreds of dead, dying and wounded Chinese soldiers were left on the killing ground. I think it 
one stage of the game where you were given an order, uh, fire until order to stop. Well, we just, you know, went hell for leather and got away as many as we could. You are. That was what I remember the most. The sharing was on a daily basis. It was very scary, but war means blood and sacrifice. You cannot avoid it. The Chinese now were exposed in their hundreds in the flat of the valley. The Australians did give them the opportunity to surrender. But when one of them foolishly fired upon the digger that was telling them to surrender, then the rest of them knew that time had come to clear the valley, and they did. We were getting them in the back as they were running away. They ran down the feature and tried to hide in thickets or any low ground they could find down towards the creek bed itself. We got excited because finally we could have a, a decent bash at them. We did plenty of firing. They were having a hell of a good time until I stopped it. That wasn't very popular. But we used a lot of ammunition during the night and the resupply didn't look too good at all at that stage. We had no contact with the rear. And so I ordered the firing to stop, save ammunition. When a large group of Chinese surrender, they get a good look at the Australians' position. The problem falls to O'Dowd. He must decide what to do with them. The last thing I needed was 40 enemy POWs. My first thought was, shoot them. Apart from the moral aspects, there were war crime tribunals all over Europe, hanging World War II commanders who had made that decision. I could not turn them loose. They knew too much. I told Darcy to take them with him. He captured them. It was his responsibility. He very tersely said, thanks a lot. And so they came with us. Despite heavy casualties, the Chinese regroup. Ignoring incoming artillery, their commanders know that with supply lines stretched thin, they cannot bring forward their own big guns. They do, though, have mortars. And they have the numbers to mount a series of relentless attacks over the next six hours. The Australians hold, despite being low on ammunition, food and water. The Canadians, in a more heavily armed and steeper position, watch on. We could see the Australians down in the valley, down on the hills, and the hills weren't that big. It wasn't like ours. And they got a quite a shellacking. It's always been my opinion that the brigadier gave the Patricias uh, that high defensible position and put the Australians in that lower, uh, less defensible position on the belief that the Australian troops were much more seasoned than we were. Yes, Ben. Yes, look. From his new headquarters, Australian Commander Ferguson, wanting to tighten their defence, orders one of O'Dowd's companies to fall back, abandoning their trenches to the Chinese. Just hold on a sec, Ben. One moment, one moment. Hello? But when Ferguson yes. learns that reinforcements from the US 5th Cavalry are on their way, he reverses the order. The diggers must now reclaim what they have left. They must attack an entrenched and heavily armed enemy, an action that will claim many lives.
for Private Stan Connolly, this action will prove costly. I was wondering what was going to happen when we got to the trench. Training never quite takes you to the point of leaping into trenches or coming to such close quarters. I could hear the bullets whistling past my ears and I thought, my turn is not that far off. Sure enough, I was knocked completely off my feet by a round that drilled a hole right through the front of my right thigh and came out the back, taking off much of my buttock. I didn't know if I could get up, but uh, I quickly decided that I'd better try and get out of there because I, I could hear the Chinese speaking to each other in the trench, and I knew there were quite a lot of them. Fierce hand-to-hand -hand combat, trench by trench. They cleared way through the enemy. Even more enemy were entrenched on a knoll further on. Their might and aggressiveness upset the Chinese. Some openly fled, the majority remained and fought to the death. In the terror of the Australians' bayonet charges, three Australians and 81 Chinese are killed. Bruce Ferguson, the Australian's commanding officer, utilising several of the US tanks, decides to bring forward medical support and ammunition. It is his first visit to the front. Ferguson arranges for the wounded to be ferried out on the tanks. Before returning to his headquarters, he tells O'Dowd that the US 5th Cavalry are still on their way. The Australians must hold. What the tanks do not bring is food and water. We always had Fergie up on a pedestal. We thought he was a, a good commander. And uh, quite rightly so too, because in the early days he was. At Cap Yong, it was a different matter. Sir. Sometime Hi. after lunch, that we did not eat, yep. did not have. Ferguson came up on the air to me and said there would be no one coming to my assistance and I could have a shot at getting out. Yep. He was a very capable commander. You could see the size of ground well, you read a map well. And in fact, he was very, very capable. His orders were very clear. Where the hell he was at Cap Young, I don't know. He certainly wasn't in the battle area. Out. Surrounded and without the support of the US 5th Cavalry, O'Dowd knows that they cannot survive another night. Forget about the road, no go. We'll go the ridge The road line. too dangerous, he picks a narrow four kilometer ridge line for his withdrawal. New Zealand guns are ordered to deliver both smoke and high explosive to cover the Australians moving out. They will commence fire at precisely 4 p.m. With only 40 minutes left, the diggers await the arrival of New Zealand artillery, which marks the beginning of their withdrawal. Then, disaster strikes. I saw a US Marine Corps airline up and start a run in on our position. I saw the big silver bomb leave the plane and watched it fall. The napalm exploded and took all the oxygen out of the air. I felt like I was just breathing heat. I 
I couldn't tell how many of our men had been hit by it, but I knew the devastating uh, effect of these bombs. And, uh, and uh, well, I was extremely distressed by it, but, uh, but there was nothing we could do, of course, nothing. Already wounded in the forehead, I must have looked a sight. Sitting there, stunned, no doubt feeling a bit sick and sorry for myself. I then saw the most appalling apparition. A man with no flesh, his hands dripping flesh, completely naked. I didn't know who he was. He looked at me and said, Jesus Nugget, you're having a bad day. The napalm strike claims two Australian dead and others who will carry the scars for life. Despite the devastation, O'Dowd's men must dig deep. They face a difficult withdrawal through a massed enemy in the dark. A mistake will see them wiped out. The planned 4 p.m. withdrawal is about to commence. As previously planned, the US tanks appear and with the New Zealand artillery assist in covering the Australians as they begin their withdrawal down the ridgeline. Night falls and the Chinese are quickly after the Australians as they go. By midnight, O'Dowd orders the last group of his men to get across the Kapyong River. Okay, let it go! The Canadians above the ford see movement and open fire. O'Dowd thought that we were firing on his troops and so ordered us to cease fire. I think we fired for about five or six minutes. Eight machine guns take care of an awful lot of casualties. We watched as the Chinese swarmed across, waiting at a shallow ford. Many dropped spread-eagled like tiny water beetles as they were hit. The Australians have fought for 24 hours. For them, the Battle of Kapyong is over. As they move to the rear, it is the Canadians who form the front line. When the Australians left, all that was left there was this battalion of understrength, really, six, seven hundred men. And the Canadians suddenly realized they were alone there. And that's when the Colonel said, look, guys, we ain't moving. And uh, you're going to stay here, so just get focus yourself that there's no pullout. Uh, you either beat these guys or uh, Oh, you're being going to be buried here. It was very uncomfortable, to say the least. You really didn't know what was going to happen. When you go into battle, you cannot think too much about yourself. Otherwise, you begin to, to lose the sense of what's going on. Chinese begin to attack the Canadians. These assaults escalate throughout the night. How did the Chinese motivate their men to sustain such bravery? In our terms, how did they persuade their troops to commit mass suicide? For the Chinese, they don't call it the suicide charges. They figure out that if you could charge uh, the enemy in a large group, it could run fast enough to top of the hill. You may have a chance. The victory depends on the people, not the weapon. Wave after wave, 
until their numbers became one continuous assault and their bodies littered the battlefield. The sight is one of an almost decapitated body, splurging blood, limbs in death throes, thrashing uselessly. It is a time of victorious relief combined with gut-wrenching fear. Oh my God, please may I never be the victim. Despite the carnage, the Chinese commanders use lulls in the fighting to marshal more and more troops in. And these men came up the hill as though they were ghosts floating. I couldn't discern a single sound. They just kept floating up the hill. It is like shooting tin ducks in a gallery. They are so bloody close. I simply cannot miss. It is such a relief to feel victorious, to know that you are actually going to live another day. We never got out of there, because that's where we were told to fix bayonets. So we had to hold no matter what. We're wiped out, soul is taken. War means anger and hatred. You have to feel that to kill someone. You have to get angry before you kill the enemy. If I don't kill the enemy, he will kill me. That's the truth of it. Damn scary, that's for sure. You don't know if you're going to get a bayonet in you, but you want to get one in him first because you're so close. And uh, a lot of things I know went through my mind. I'm 20 years old. Jesus, am I going to see 21? <laughs> the next day, we found one corporal whose bayonet was through his enemy, and the enemy's bayonet was through him. They both followed what they were ordered to do. The force of numbers has at last paid off for the Chinese. Kapyong can still be theirs. By 3 a.m. on the third day, one of the Canadian platoons is cut off and overrun. To survive, the Canadians must take an extreme measure. Lieutenant Mike Levy acts quickly. He calls the New Zealanders to direct artillery fire onto his own men. He will attempt to wipe the Chinese off the battlefield. You have a better chance in your trenches dug in than the Chinese have coming in and joining you. Uh, and so that was, I think, platoon commanders sort of lusted for the day they could call artillery on themselves. You know, you feel like a big shot, and it's, it sounds lethal. And when the Canadians did it at Capion, the New Zealand artillery commander said, uh, you know, Jesus, mate, it's your position. And, uh, and the captain who orders it uh, said, yeah. They fired thousands and thousands of rounds of ammunition that night. The damn guns were dying just about red hot, with the 25 pounders were just going bung, and other ones bunged in, and they just keep firing. Levy called for that fire to last, and it lasted for 40 minutes because the Chinese just threw wave after wave after wave. And without that close artillery support and the airburst shell, uh, Levy would have been wiped out. To my mind, as far as the Patricias are concerned, Levy won our last battle and the most significant part of the battle at Cap Yong.
When the dawn arrives, the Chinese have withdrawn, and D Company still controls their area of Hill 677. We are now virtually out of ammunition. I have often wondered if the Chinese commanders ever found out how close they came to destroying us. The slaughter is something I never want to see or experience again. At the time you do it, you're so glad you're alive and you're surviving. But the slaughter of the enemy was just unimaginable. It, it, it looked like a slaughterhouse. Sometimes it still gives me nightmares. That's how the enemy gets back at you when you have your nightmares. They're always worse than the actual battle. The Battle of Kapyong is over. On Anzac Day, 1951, the Canadians bring down their dead. The Commonwealth Brigade has halted the might of the Chinese army and stop them from streaming south and retaking Seoul. People still don't know about it. It's a forgotten battle in a forgotten war, largely. But it was a, but it was a, 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 I think the key battle that the Commonwealth Division fought in, in the whole Korean War. The Battle of Kapyong lasted three days. The Canadians have lost 10 men killed, the Australians 32, and the New Zealanders one. Estimates of the Chinese dead vary between 1,000 and 4,000 soldiers. The Americans, responding to the importance of the Commonwealth Brigade's stand, award the Canadians and Australians with an American presidential citation for their action at Kapyong. The New Zealanders are overlooked. Lieutenant Mike Levy, who won the final battle for the Patricias, receives no recognition from the Canadian government. You know, so many things happen in battle that oversights occur. You hear so many instances in battle where somebody did something very significant, somebody else gets the award. It just happens. The Australian commander, Lieutenant Colonel Bruce Ferguson, is awarded the Distinguished Service Order for his command of the Battle of Kapyong. Major Ben O'Dowd is overlooked. O'Dowd performed magnificently at Kapyong, and if O'Dowd had been defeated, then that, that, was, that was good night nurse. There's no doubt about that, because he held the crossing. See, Odea should have had a medal. Even if they gave him a bloody MID, I wouldn't give a stuff, provided they recognised what he did at Cap Yong. And uh, I, I think it's terribly important that, uh, see, our, our men would die happy then. It is impossible for anyone who has not participated in the front lines of war to fully appreciate the comradeship of veterans, where everyone shares the moment, senses the agonies and the fears of death, the meaningful acts of bravery, the sacrifices for a comrade, the joy of survival. I felt towards the Chinese, they're in the same position as us. Their government says we're going to war. We go to war like a Second World War. I have nothing against them. You get drafted in, eh? They don't want to go. I'm positive of it. I have no hate against them. When we would defeat a position and take it, the troops would obviously search the bodies, 
But what would they discover in the main? Pictures of loved ones, babies, wives, children. They, like us, were ordered to fight. The Korean War has long gone. It doesn't matter now. It doesn't matter to me anymore. Who cares? Whether the war is good or bad, it's up to the politicians. I'm done with it. War has no pity. So many people die. It doesn't matter which side won. Chinese die, Koreans die, and Americans die. So many die. So, it would be best if there was no more war. <laughs> After Kapyong, the Chinese never again mount a major offensive. The Korean conflict changes to a static trench war, and it takes two years before a truce is signed. The truce redivides South and North Korea more or less along the same dividing line as before. The two Koreas remain divided to this day. <laughs>